So today we're going to be talking about documentation as UX, or how you can rightfully write the right things, because alliteration is fun and not that complicated. So real quick, who am I? Uh, I'm the co-organizer of the St. Louis PowerShell user group. Uh, I'm a sometimes host of a, a, like a podcast chat show where I interview really interesting people uh, and talk to them about what they're working on, try to get their feel for the industry. Um, I'm a, it says frequent uh, contributor to open source. It should be like dabbler uh, of open source PowerShell projects. There's a lot of stuff where I've added like a one-line fix or I've complained about something, but then my name ends up there. So if you look, it's like nine or 10 or 12 different projects, but like I don't think one line counts, but GitHub doesn't distinguish, so neither will I. Um, I'm also a Puppet software engineer. I joined their team relatively recently. I work on the Windows integration stuff, uh, the modules pr primarily. Uh, and at heart, uh, deep, deep down, I am a documentarian. We'll talk more about what that might mean to you shortly. So before we can really talk about how you can treat your documentation as UX, we've got to define what UX is. So a pair of very smart humans define UX as all aspects of the end user's interaction with the company, its services, and its products. You know it's official because it's smart and it's kind of italicized at the end. Like that, that's a pretty good indicator. <laughs> so do you need that for like CLI tools, like your scripts and your PowerShell functions? It doesn't really make sense to have, like and should you treat it like UX? Um, Randall Hansen defined uh, using your command line as something akin to submarine warfare. You're in an unfriendly environment any sort of breach in the system or error in your process could cause catastrophic damage. So it's gonna be a little bit of a crowd participatory talk here. So I, I wanna know, those of you who have blown up prod, could you raise your hands for me? Yeah, that's uh, pretty unanimous, uh, it seems. <laughs> so like we've all done it, like we're gonna burn it down again probably by the end of next week. Um, the UX itself though is a really deep rabbit hole. So I'm gonna briefly touch on this stuff, understand each of these is a discipline in and of itself, that there are like full groups of humans that go through and learn this stuff and talk about it. I am not remotely smart enough to talk about most of this in sufficient detail. Um, so navigation, right? So uh, navigation UX, what is it like when I start moving around in your application or your environment, the thing that you've built for me to use? What does that look like? How does it feel? Is it sane? Can I get from point A to point B? Or did you drop me off in the middle of it with a compass and a good luck? Um, what's the structure like, right? So does the structure follow sensible semantics? Can I reasonably infer things about your product or project based on the things I've already seen? Do the names make sense? Does the stuff kind of flow from that? So flowing forward from that, this is especially important for command line tools, is semantics. Do the phrases and words that you use in your application make sense? So for PowerShell, good example of where they nailed this, right, is the approved verbs, right? So your approved verbs, ensure that I have a very good understanding of what you're gonna do. Unless you lied to me, which you should never do. If you've picked something that has an approved verb, use the right one and stick to what it says you're gonna do, right? Visual organization, doesn't matter as much to us maybe. Um, visual organization is how does the layout sit? What does it look like? Um, kind of touches back on navigation. Can I get around it? Does it make sense? Um, does it flow in a way that humans are able to grok it and see it and kind of move through it? Does it follow familiar patterns? Color. This is an entire, I kid you not, field of study around the impact of changing colors across like how your stuff is going to drive an emotional response and whether or not that's going to be a good thing for your product. Um, I'm super impressed by that whole field of study, but I'm like way too dumb to follow it for the most part. Uh, usage, right? This is one that's also going to be really important to us. Um, does the way that people use your tool, uh, one of the things we talk about is the naive expectation of a user. Does that make sense? Does it bite them? If a user does like the natural thing, so a good example is when you pick up a shovel, right? You pick up a shovel, you kind of want to stick it in the ground, and it's got, the little, it's got the little lips on it, so you put your foot on that, push down, right? Well, if there was a spike there, you probably wouldn't put your foot on it, would you, right? Sometimes we build tools that have spikes instead of lips, like we should think about those things. Um, and then all of it kind of comes back to expectations. All of this is driven around what users will expect and will naturally do outside of any sort of change in impetus. A much less smart person than the previous quotes uh, defines documentation as artifacts explaining something in sufficient detail. Um, I'm going to kind of highlight this right here for a minute because mentioning stuff in passing doesn't count as docs. Uh, it's actually sort of anti-docs. You're like, you should think about security and then whistle off into the night. That's, uh, that doesn't count. You don't get points for that. 
So there are three types of docs to write. Uh, we're going to talk about the threefold doc model. So real briefly, you have reference docs. Then you have narrative docs. And then you have concept docs. We're going to have slides explaining all this, so don't worry. So three types of docs to write and in your repos commit them. Why in your repos, I hear you asking so, so loudly in this room? Uh, well, they should be in plain text. Okay, plain text in a repository. Okay, so it can be diffed, so you can get a differential on what the text is over time. And you can see the history. So we're gonna take a brief aside here, talk about how super duper important keeping your stuff in source control is. This is Markdown. You may have seen some of this earlier this week in a couple of different presentations. It's got a little bit of markup. So this right here will show it in italics. This will be bold, right? It's plain English, you can read it. There's no real problems around that. It's relatively uh, out of the way, right? And it pretty much won the wars on what markup language we're gonna use for plain text. You're gonna keep your code with your docs, right? You're gonna write documentation, you're gonna keep it with your code. And I'm gonna hammer on this a lot today, right? So uh, how many of you have documentation that lives in SharePoint or ServiceNow or some other place? Yeah, a lot of you. Okay, when was the last time those were in sync with your code? Anybody have that currently in sync? And was it yesterday that you posted that stuff? <laughs> was there one hand at the back that said you do have it all in sync? See? So come, come, come talk to me again in 30 days. We'll see how, how close it is, right? So the reason for this is that the further your documentation lives from your code, the less likely you are to update it. The harder it is to get your team to update it, and the more likely it is that you're not gonna notice when it gets out of sync. If every time you change the code, you have to change the docs for somebody else to approve that change, it's really, really easy to stay on top of, relatively. So real quick, you'll see here, where are my docs? One folder up from my source code magic. You'll notice that they get updated pretty much alongside each other. So diffing, what's diffing? So uh, in the land of source control, we talk about being able to diff our changes. So you can check precisely how your stuff changed. Let's look at an example of that real quick. So here in this first example, you can see there's some, uh, there's some green stuff here. It doesn't really display as green. It almost looks white on my angle anyway. Does it look green to you? No. Nope. That's weird. Okay, whatever. So here's the change. Like, I went to so much effort to switch this out. I'm so happy I did. Um, so this is showing you what I added, and you can see the little plus signs over here as well. We added three lines to this document. So that's important to be able to find. It's like, okay, well, he added these three things. Okay, let's look at something a little bit more complicated. So this change set here was when I ripped out all of the code from our main build script um, and turned it into a, a bit of a, a more modular approach. So I just took everything that had to do with documentation, I moved it out, so you'll see here I have an include ps script root docs.saki, so it all lives in that file now, which is up here, and you can see it's got a whole bunch of nonsense. And then down here, you can also see that there's a bunch of stuff that's ripped, with a little minus sign here, these lines. So what that is, if you notice, those mention docsy stuff. The reason for that is that I pulled all that out of here so it doesn't exist anymore. Okay, so those are examples where like, yeah, but I know what I removed and what I added. What if I change a single line? Right? I don't know if it shows to you, but this is a little bit highlighted here, right? So we've got the minus, we've got the plus, and we see exactly what was changed. So in this case, I added an alias to the project, and it shipped out with it. Okay, so if you can get diffs, and that's kind of magic, being able to see who changed what, when, and why is just, it's out and out magic. Like, it's, it's, the, it's the secret sauce behind why everybody really needs to be using source control. So here's the same three changes, but now we're seeing what the reasons for them were. So here we can see I added some options, made a whole bunch of little changes here. If all you had was the file got updated, how easy is it to determine when it happened? Oh, and you can see exactly which person's responsible for all the terrible things I did. Yeah, he's a bad person. You can also see what happened in this change set. I touched 13 files. I added 188 lines and removed nine. So this was like a net add to the code base. The second one, we separated the docs for reusability. You saw that I ripped some stuff out and moved it, had some other stuff added. Here, it tells you again what the reasoning for it was. Prior to this commit, this is how things looked. After this commit, here's how they are now. And then the third one, adding the Git plugin thing that we saw where there was that, that one line change uh, in that single file. You can see here again why we did it and what that was about. 
Um, I cannot stress enough how important a form of documentation this secretly is for future you and people who join your team, people who have to try to work with your code or help you with your code. This is insanely valuable and should never be overlooked. And then here you can just see, there's the separate the docs test, so you can see when it happened, who did it. You can recover at any point in time all of that information, all the change sets, and, and go back towards um, the code as it lived at that point. You can see all those ones. Next up, uh, real brief aside, let's talk about scope and audiences, right? So projects have different scopes. Um, some of you write docs that are for your entire team. Everybody who's doing operations has to follow these things. This is what you do when the bad guys get in. This is what you do when the really important database that pays us goes down, right? Sometimes you have a PowerShell module and you just want to talk about like here's how you use the tools and here's how you run the things and here's the considerations and please, please, please don't run this against prod without a filter because you'll burn everything and the DBAs will come for you. Um, and then the other thing we want to talk about is your audience. All of your tools that you have have at least one audience um, and they probably have more than one. So there's an internal audience which are the people on your team, the maintainers, other ops folks, um, business members who are going to rely on these things. And then there's external uh, facing folks. So like if you publish PowerShell to the gallery, those types of people who are going to be using it external from your team who you can't like go to their desk and yell at them about stuff. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more uh, specifically about which ones we're going to do. For the purpose of this, we're going to focus on a PowerShell module because it's probably what most of you are writing. So I said we would come back to this. What are reference docs? Well, reference docs explain technical details uh, and usage of a project. So you're probably pretty familiar with them. They're pretty much ubiquitous, everybody has them, uh, and you've probably stopped using things that don't have reference docs because that's unforgivable, right? If you can't explain what parameters are available for a product, I'm not gonna use it. I'm just, I don't know, I'm not gonna like fire a gun into prod for no good reason. Uh, but they're not good enough, right? Like just having reference docs isn't good enough for me to want to use your stuff. So for PowerShell, Comment-based help is your reference documentation, right? Everybody in the room, you're writing reference docs, right? Raise your hands. This is not, this is not optional. All of you are writing reference docs. Glenn? <laughs> he was doing the hand waffle. I wasn't calling him out. Uh, about topic, you can do reference docs here. Um, if you saw Sergey's uh, talk earlier, I'm a bit of a heathen here. I actually don't write about help um, for reasons that we'll get into around where it mostly gets read. Platypus is phenomenal. If you're not using Platypus with your reference documentation, you need to. You really, really do. It's a huge quality of life helper. It allows you to take your comment-based help and output it to Markdown for further postings elsewhere. Um, if you're a believer in the philosophy that I don't follow, you can actually keep all your reference docs in Markdown. But that makes it live further from the code and then therefore, in my opinion, harder to update. So. Briefly, I'm sure you've all seen this because all your hands went up. This is what comment-based help looks like, right? This is comment-based help whenever you do it from the help system. You do get help, something or other, show window, right? Same thing, we've all seen these. This is what it looks like when you convert it to Markdown and output it to a website that your users can access whenever they feel like it instead of getting it from the prompt. So you're able to generate this with Platypus. You don't have to write anything at all extra. You just get this for magical free. Narrative docs, let's talk about these. These are a different one. If you guys have questions, throw your hands up, yell at me, whatever, speak up. Uh, so narrative docs, they explain how and why users can or should do things, or equally importantly, should not do things. We've all built tools that'll shoot your feet off and telling people how to avoid that's a good idea. So narrative docs, if you have guessed by the title, use the structure of a story. First there was a problem, and then someone had to solve the problem, and then they started making progress, and then there was a setback, and then they solved the problem and everything was wonderful. Um, these help you dig pits of success. Are you familiar with that term, what a pit of success is? The idea being if your user's rambling along, just kind of using your tool, they'll fall into a pit, and instead of spikes at the bottom, it's delicious cake and wonder. <laughs> it is not a lie in this case, sir. So. Um, one of the sad facts is that for uh, technical documentation, narrative docs are almost r always written by outsiders. Um, I think I saw Dan Franciscus in the room earlier. Yeah, so Dan back there, who I'm going to shine lights on. Thank you. <laughs> so Dan, uh, he's written some blogs um, about a whole bunch of stuff, but 
that's sort of where narrative documentation gets done, is that people, users of your project, find it, like it, enjoy using it, and they decide, you know what? I bump my feet on things. I'm going to write a thing for future me so that I don't do that again. Like, bear traps hurt. I don't want to step in them. Um, which is not really good for us, like, as people who maintain projects. Oh, well, that's not true. It's great. It's magic, right? Somebody else writing your docs is the best thing that can possibly happen to you. However, we should probably also be writing them. It seems important. They're the most effective type. You, as a human, I assume there's no lizard people in the audience. Um, right, well, exactly one. And the other one is, uh, I think he's talking to Congress today. Um, <laughs> so uh, they're the most effective type. You're wired to hear stories. You're wired to remember stories. So a really quick way that we can kind of recap on this and prove the point, right? Uh, how many of you can quote to me some reference documentation you've ever read? No. OK. How many of you can quote a line from a movie or a particularly pithy tweet that you've seen or something somebody said in a conversation anytime recently? Anybody? There's a few. It's not a thuma. Get to the chopper. Yeah. So see, that's the point. Like, your brain is wired for that. Like, you're just built for it. Like, there's nothing you can do about it. The way that your mind works, narrative is always going to work better for you. So here's an example of narrative documentation. This is all written in Markdown. Um, so it gives you a bit of a, a better C. You can actually see towards here, I have some code embedded in it. You'll notice that there's this nice little syntax highlighting, almost as if it cared about what I had had in there, which is pretty neat. So this is just the markdown. There's nothing magic about it. Uh, you too can write it, I promise. Here's the same thing rendered, right? So we took that markdown. This is what people find on the website whenever they go to view the documentation, which, if you notice, is more friendly to read, and it has hyperlinks and stuff like that. That's pretty neat. So let's talk about concept docs. This is kind of my favorite thing and or pet peeve, depending on how you look at it. So concept docs, they answer specific questions, right? And we're going to talk about what those are here very, very shortly. Um, they're the least common type. Uh, you may have noticed almost nobody writes these. Uh, they're pretty much missing from everything. Um, you'll see them sometimes in PowerShell stuff where they'll do like about some sort of esoteric thing to do with your new module because it's confusing and different. But most of the time we just go, ah, blah, blah, which is not a good answer. Um, but if you want mandatory uh, good user experience, if you want people to fall into that pit of success, if you want people to be happy and love your stuff, walk up to other people and be like, oh, have you tried playing with this tool? It's great. You got to use it. Then you need to have concept docs. So what are some of those questions and, and how could this possibly be an important thing that you'd have to do? What questions could somebody possibly have about your project, yes, your project, that they would need to have answered? Anybody here ever done something and somebody else on the team is like, I don't like the way you did this. Why'd you do that? I heard chuckles. I, I get you. I'm in the same boat. Right? So why you chose a specific design? If anybody asks you, why'd you do X instead of Y more than once, that's a hint that you're missing a concept doc. How does this internal component work? Why was it used? You know, I see that you guys have built this stuff on Ruby, but did you consider rewriting everything in Go? Yeah, we, we did, but like nobody writes Go, so why would we do that? <laughs> Uh, when should I not use a particular feature? I talked about this a little bit earlier. There's plenty of times where like everything has good uses and bad uses, right? Like you shouldn't do like not everything's a, a nail. And if you're trying to use this thing like a hammer, you're eventually going to hit your finger or somebody else or get fired. Don't do that. So uh, a good example of this is if you have a tool that'll uh, shotgun data at a series of web farm nodes, maybe don't run that in prod or don't run it during certain hours, right? Or if you've got something that's going to suck up data and display it in a report, make sure that you're doing some scrubbing before you do that. These are the types of things that you need to be answering for yourself internally, right? but for external folks too. Uh, what do I do when I'm implementing this project in my environment? How many of you have picked up a new product and it's time to like get it in place? And they're like, yeah, so here's how you do it in dev, and this is something, something certificates, and then good luck securing it and getting it working by. There's a lot of enterprise, uh, using the term loosely, products that do that to you. Right? Um, has anybody ever implemented something and then realized that their implementation was wrong? <laughs> Show hands, thanks. Uh, and then what are the best patterns and practices and which ones should I avoid? So same sort of thing, like, yeah, you can set it up with no encryption, but should you ever? No. Like, you should encrypt everything between all your endpoints, right? Everybody's using HTTPS everywhere. No. Yeah, see, thank you, Tito. Well, you're at Google, of course you are. <laughs> Yeah, you get yelled at very loudly. 
So another brief aside, internal versus external. Uh, most of the rest of this documentation talk when we're looking at stuff is going to focus on your external audience, but keep in mind that your internal audience is critically important to you, right? Like, have you ever gone on vacation and been confused when you came back? Like, something's changed, you don't know what or why? It's like, well, I was trying to run the deployment script and it all caught fire. Oh yeah, no, we updated that on Thursday. You didn't know? No. So you've got three types of documentation, right? But there's uncountable forms, and I'm not kidding, right? I literally didn't count these. You can if you want. So there's centralized docs. This is the stuff we're all really familiar with, right? Static sites, wikis, Confluence, ServiceNow, SharePoint. GitHub and GitLab templates. For those of you who don't know, you can use these little meta document things inside of GitHub and GitLab. So if somebody goes, new issue, it fills out some basic information for you and it, pro it provides uh, like a layout for like what's your OS, what's the bug, here's where you should upload things, send me this link, paste the error messages into this like, uh, like paste bin type area, whatever. So those will kind of funnel people into like your expectations around your project and you'll help you get some good bug fixes and stuff. Emails, uh, how many of you write emails to users when things catch fire? Anybody? You all avoid talking to users, right? Okay, good. <laughs> no. <laughs> so emails to users and to other people on your team, right? So anytime you're explaining something about your project, that's documentation. Whether or not you treat it that way, it is, right? You're communicating technical details to another human. And you're explaining something. So if you have canned emails for like, hey, I was trying to log on, but X went wrong. And you're like, well, yeah, you need to clear your cookies. Send that email. That's a good documentation. You th should think about maintaining some of those that way. So chat. Chat's documentation. Sure. So Slack, Teams, Mattermost, HipChat, Stripe, is it, that replaces HipChat soon? Um, so any of your chat apps, IRC, if you're really old school. Um, the advantage here is somebody asks a question on your team or um, maybe what's one of your users or customers. They say, hey, how do I X? Somebody's going to answer that question and be like, oh, well, the way that you X is you Y and you Z, right? And then there's like, well, I don't understand how you Z. Conversation comes out and there's a lot of explaining, a lot of link sharing and stuff. And then tomorrow morning, you come into work, somebody else comes up and say, hey, how do you X? Well, you can search and find it for yourself. That's not what you say, but that's what you mean. And then you send it to them, and then all of that information is captured, searchable, and available. That is probably, for me, the, like, the best part about these tools, being able to go back and find all of the answers that you've already shared. But again, you've documented processes. Not formally, right? but you've done documentation. You've got it down. You can convert it later, or you can just point people to it. Forums and Stack Overflow. I already know the answer. Show of hands, who uses Stack Overflow, right? Everybody here has copied code from it right into production before, right? <laughs> that's what we do, right? That's why we get paid the big bucks. Uh, <laughs> forums, that sort of thing. Same sort of thing, right? Somebody asks a question, you answer it. Um, if your team is putting products out there, um, this is more for, for vendor -y side of things, um, or if you work on things, that have bitten you before. Being active on Stack Overflow is a great way to build up informal documentation that people can use because it has really good SEO and you don't have to pay for it. You just let Stack do it. Blogs. Uh, we talked about narrative documentation. Dan's blog, Glenn's blog. How many of you have a blog or read blogs? All, right, all of you read blogs. No hands should be down. Okay. <laughs> I know you do. So those are also documentation, mostly for people who didn't pay them to write the docs, which I think is pretty neat at least for the companies who are getting them to write the docs for free. Meta documents. What are meta documents? Commit logs. Every time you make a change in source control and you forward it around, you have a commit log. It tells you exactly what changed and when. That's where we got that diff information. That's where we got that history information. It tells you who did it, why, when, and exactly what that change was. Right? That stuff is documentation of your design decisions, the patterns you followed, what was important at that point in time. There's a ton of information to be gleaned from this stuff. Issue comments. Uh, does anybody work either internal, like so it doesn't have to be publicly available, right? But like, do you have like a private GitHub or VSTS or TFS or GitLab or whatever, right? Do you use the issuing system in there? So for those of you who are lucky enough to be allowed to use that, or Jira, right? It's the same sort of thing. We'll cover that in the tickets thing that comes up next. So somebody says they file an issue. They say I think your project should X or right. You know, I was using your script and then this thing happened and it's terrible and you burned down prod and this is all your fault. Like, well, had you known not to run it without a filter, you'd have been fine. What it really means is you need to write a doc. But that explains it and says where it all came from, why these things had to happen. Shows you the history of why you made decisions, which is as important as what decisions got made, right? 
come in on Thursday, oh, the deployment script changed. Why? Probably it's in these two things, right? Now that information lives somewhere. And hopefully, it also lives in ticket data and change logs, which we'll talk about too. So ticket data is the same sort of thing. It's just another place for it to live. Anybody use Jira and or ServiceNow, right? Similar tools, Remedy, whatever. Um, Somebody files a ticket, they say, hey, X is broken, I need this fixed. You say, okay, I ran script Y, and here's where it went, and here's how it worked. All of a sudden, you have some data, some documentation explaining what to do when that happens again, or what not to do. That also happens, right? Like, we tried to fix these things, and uh, we're sorry. <laughs> Licenses, these are very important. If you have work that you ever want another person to use ever, include a license. MIT is my preferred licensing, because it's super open and available. You can do Apache or whatever you want. Uh, talk to legal, um, but if you have work out on the gallery or anywhere publicly right now and you don't have a license, uh, no one's gonna use it, uh, especially anybody that's working at a company. They can't, they, they, they literally are not allowed to use a thing without a license. Even if you say publicly on Twitter, hey man, it's fine, you can use it, bro, it's all good. They're not gonna do it because that liability is really, really scary to legal. So put a license in, it takes you 30 seconds, they're templated out, you don't have to do any extra work. Change log. So for those of you who have code, how many of you have a comment section at the top of your code that says what your changes were? Yeah, let's not do that, let's keep change logs. These things are magic, right? So what a change log is, and the, the preferred format is keepachangelog.org, keepachangelog.org. You go there, find it, there's a really good standardized way for you to do change logs, really readable, really useful. We've been adopting those at Puppet and it's been pretty great. Uh, can't strongly recommend them enough. There's plenty of information and detail around it. So the reason that, uh, so if your commit logs and your issued comments and your ticket data are for you, the maintainers, right, what are the chances that a customer is ever gonna read your commit history? Zero. No one is. But this tells people, when I took off on Thursday and I came back and then there was a new release of this tool, what changed and why, and do I care? Right, so if you're following good versioning and all the other kinds of stuff, your change log should show you exactly what changed and how much I should care about it. Contributing. Again, if you want people to work on your projects, include a contributing doc. It'll take you 30 seconds. You can do like I do and steal from Brandon. Uh, Olin, he's actually giving a talk in another room right now. Uh, he's got a nice little contributing doc. There's a bunch of different ways you can get them. So what these do is they ease the path towards working on your project or working with you on tools. Contributing doc says, hey, here's the things I expect from you. Like if you add code, add tests. If you add code that changes parameters or whatever, add documentation. Here's how you file issues. Here's where to go. Here's my expectations. Here's a code of conduct, whatever. All the information about how other humans can work with your humans, right? Have your people talk to my people. That's all covered here. We're really not done yet. I wasn't kidding. Like there's so many forms of documentation, right? So. Documentation in your code, right? Uh, how many of you have got a comment that says, I don't know why this works, but it does, please don't remove it, right? Yeah, that's a lot of hands. I wrote that earlier this week. Uh, so let's talk about a couple of different types, right? Tests. Uh, if you've attended any of the test talks this week, you might have noticed that the tests describe expected behavior, which you might also recognize as documentation. Right, tells you what you're expecting or what might be dangerous. Right, Tells you when you're looking at code and you see the tests, what are the things that are important about this project? What are the things that are dangerous about this project? And it kind of covers both of those. Code comments, like we talked about, like everybody's got them, or you should, right? Uh, do yourselves a favor, specific type of code comment you can do whenever you do a regex capture, uh, show what the thing is you're trying to capture in a code comment above it, like this is meant to match this thing, because future you will not remember. Inline documentation, so uh, PowerShell's got uh, comment-based help, Ruby's got these little describe blocks, pretty much every language has these. Use these, um, don't ever fail to fill these out, that's pretty inexcusable for you long-term. It, it's low, low-hanging fruit to add, um, but that way your documentation can live really, really close to the code that you're writing. But we're really not done yet, there's non-written docs, right? So what are non-written docs? We don't think about these very often. So far we've talked about stuff you can do with a keyboard. Audio documentation like podcasts and voiceovers. So we actually have an attendee here today uh, who isn't able to see, right? Uh, and I don't know if you've ever listened to Siri try to read off something to you, but it's not a super good experience. So consider having someone who goes through and provides a really good, thorough experience reading documentation, right? It's a little thing, we don't really think about it. it it's not as expensive as you think it is, and it's super, super useful for inclusivity. Um, podcasts, how many of you listen to podcasts, anybody? 
good number of people. Yeah. So the advantage, I'm holding the water instead of drinking it. So the good thing about podcasts is podcasts are a, a combination of narrative and concept docs. People give on the fly. No one writes them, but they talk a lot, right? We're like, oh, remember that time we did that thing and it hurt? It's a concept doc that lives in a podcast. So it's also a lot easier to get engineers on your team to get together and talk and like share stories and stuff than it is to get them to write those things down and then do internationalization around them and all that's really, really hard for them. So you can convince them just to kind of like talk and that'll work too. A video. Um, so if future you is watching this, then you're getting a form of video documentation around documentation. But it includes tutorials, recordings, lectures. So good examples include like plural site courses, that sort of thing. Um, gives you a really good insight into how something's supposed to work or how you should use things. Live, which if present you is here, you're currently experiencing. Um, other forms include, in addition to like, you know, talks and stuff, labs. Uh, labs are a phenomenal form of documentation. It explains what you think is important about your project or product and how people can use it, where the bear traps are, because pretty much every lab is a don't do this section, right? And then Q&A, which we'll hopefully get to at the end of this, is similar. So we're going to focus, I guess we might have time for my demo. Sweet. Have I been breathing? Has anybody noticed? I know I'm sweating, but I'm definitely breathing. I did breathe twice. Thank you so much, Foreman. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, documenting a PowerShell module using uh, the tooling that I have called Documentarian, which is just a PowerShell core module. I wasted a lot of time making it run cross-plat, even though four of you will use it not on Windows. <laughs> <laughs> but it works. So uh, we're going to talk about documenting it. So what we're going to do is we're going to use Plaster to scaffold out a PowerShell project. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to use Documentarian to scaffold out the docs and see what that looks like, what that experience will be for you if you choose to use a tool that you should use. Not that I'm opinionated. So uh, the module is Documentarian. You can find it at gitlab.com slash documentarian slash documentarian or forward stroke, depending on who you asked. Uh, you don't need to see me import, but the important thing here you'll be able to see shortly is that there's a, a line where I export a variable. Not many uh, projects export variables. It's not real common. The reason for this is there's no way for you to do searching on plaster templates. And you'll see how super duper important this variable is shortly. I promise you it's going to be really, really useful for you. So we're going to get the plaster template. This is us getting that basic template so that we can invoke it. So get the plaster template where it matches the new Marshall Manifest module. And then expand the property on template path. And that'll give you the path to the template which you need to do uh, invoke template or invoke plaster. Right, so now that we've gathered it, it's time to go ahead and scaffold us a PowerShell project. See, I saved it to that variable in the last one. We've got it here. It's going to ask us a couple questions. So Plaster uh, is a tool that will ask you questions and scaffold things out. So uh, it asked us for, are you going to reset? Nope. Good enough. We're stuck with it. That's fine. So it asked uh, what module name we wanted it to be. We chose Summiteer. Uh, it asked what version we wanted. We set it at the default. And then it asked, you know, did we want to have it set for VS Code, which is what I'm using here. So now we're just opening it up. Take a look. It's scaffolded out, just real basic. If you saw um, uh, Ron's talk earlier, Rob's talk earlier, you probably saw some plastery things. It's the exact same thing here. I didn't change anything. Any questions about plaster? No? Totally confusing and obtuse? Good. You don't need to know how the magic works. It's not all that important because the real magic is in getting your docs. So here we're doing the exact same thing, invoke plaster, but I gave you that nice little thing so you didn't have to find the template, discover it and everything. So here, same thing, uh, it asks a few questions. What's the name of the project? What's your brief description? Here we say project with quality of life functions for summit attendees. Ask me how I knew it would say that. Watch how fast I type too, isn't this great? Uh, so I'm the primary author and I'm the person that has the, uh, the legal rights to it, I guess. And then here you'll see it scaffolded out a whole bunch of different um, files and folders, right? So all of these things are also going to be in there. We go back, you look, there was this, the, the two uh, files that were there now, accompanied by a readme, a change log, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, the description ended up at the top of the readme. Kind of just does a little bit of basic help for you, but you're going to have to you know, write documentation like I can't do that for you. I can do some of it, but not all. And then it uh, includes a build script for you. This is probably the thing that you're going to find most useful, is it includes a build script that will allow you to do live previews of your documentation in uh, your browser and allow you to do uh, builds whenever you go through CI if you have that. 
And then it scaffolds out all the files and folders and all like the kind of useful quality of life stuff. So this, you should only have to do this once whenever you spin up a new project or you want to add docs to an existing project. Here it's going to kind of fly through. Uh, it's doing that live preview of just the base. So all it's done is scaffolded out the docs. And right now <coughs> it's going through and just building the website. So then, yeah, and click. Good. And then this is the whole thing scaffolded out, right? Isn't that magic? So it just fills out a couple of base things. Um, notice it doesn't add reference docs because there's no functions or anything like that yet. And that's the, uh, the demo piece. If you're interested, I can show you what the actual documentation and all that looks like afterwards too. So let's talk about some quick takeaways, right? When we talked about docs a little bit. So your docs need to live as close to your code as they absolutely possibly humanly can. You should write more than just reference docs, but hopefully you're at least writing reference docs. Um, the words you choose matter. Um, the way that humans are wired, the words that you use in your documentation are gonna make a really big impact on how they're gonna receive it and how useful it's gonna be for each person. Um, to that effect, you wanna think about whether or not your product should have gendered pronouns whenever you're explaining how things work. And if you're gonna use he, him everywhere, like I guess the only people who use your product are guys, which is probably not true. That's, I think I've heard 50-ish percent of the population doesn't do that. Something around that, I guess? I don't know. I'm not an expert, clearly. Um, so your words matter, uh, the word choice matters. You want to think about who your audiences are and what you're writing for. You need to pay attention to it. It really doesn't take that much effort. Uh, write and design specifically, right? So same thing. You have a particular project, a particular product. You're writing it for specific humans to use, right? It solves a specific problem. It's not the end-all, be-all of everything always, right? Because those projects are super hard to maintain. So you want to write and design specifically the same way that you'd write and pay attention to your code and make sure that it meets its uh, particular requirements. You want to do that for your docs too. Um, and you don't want to forget how many different forms there are. I spent like nine slides covering that. So if you could not forget that part, I'd appreciate it. And then the same way that you treat your code, you iterate, right? How many people have written something, published it, and then it was just good forever? It never had bugs or problems or anything. Anybody? Not seeing a lot of hands go up. Yeah, that's suspicious. <sighs> So there's a bunch of resources here. Uh, I have a project I talked on last year called Needful Docs that explains sort of the same thing. Nice and punchy, you can send it to coworkers. It explains the threefold doc model. All this stuff's uh, posted afterwards too. You can check out on, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll find it all. Um, write the docs. Uh, I think their like, uh, event is almost always out of Portland. Um, so Write the Docs is an amazing conference where you can get together and listen to people talk who are super smart. Actual documentarians, like people who professionally get paid dollars on purpose to write docs. We'll share how they do this and how it works, and it's awesome. Um, does anybody know who June Blender is? You ever heard the name like once or twice or 35 times? Um, so she still has some incredible stuff up on GitHub. She's not doing as much with PowerShell now, but if you've never checked out the PowerShell Help Deep Dive, you need to. It'll help you write a 1,000% better PowerShell. Uh, the Markdown Guide is just a real quick like five-minute walkthrough on how you can write Markdown and what that syntax looks like. I have more resources. Uh, Tracy Osborne wrote a Medium post on five tips for improving your technical writing and documentation. Uh, human readable stuff that'll help you out, help you kind of get to a point where you understand better like uh, some of the concerns around writing technical docs that I just couldn't cover here. Like something we didn't talk about, internationalization. That's hard. Uh, gender neutral technical writing is another thing. So you're concerned like, well, I don't know how to change how I write. This will walk you through it. Just some really simple kind of quick pointers. There are still more resources. Uh, Hacker Noon's writing good documentation, super useful. Uh, I have this bookmarked, I check it out pretty frequently. Jacob Kaplan Moss is pretty well known in the technical writing circles around the stuff that he's done around writing good documentation. I think he's one of the original members of Write the Docs. Um, so this is a really good resource. All this stuff, like nothing I've told you today is new or revolutionary, like I certainly didn't make any of it up. I stole exclusively from smart people. So this is the part where you get to applaud and or heckle me. Um, you can find me on Twitter at BarbarianKB, LinkedIn, uh, GitHub, GitLab, everywhere else on the planet at Michael T. Lombardi. Um, if you take a look at the things and stuff sucks, let me know. Yell at me, complain. The louder you complain, the more likely it is that I'll close won't fix. Um, <laughs> that's an open source joke, I'm sorry. Um, uh, thank you though, thank you for coming out. Thank you for uh, sitting through this while I kind of sweat slash speed yelled at you. I appreciate your time. Any questions?